three down here. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to spend as much time talking about sort of the evaluation of life, except kind of as how it relates to what you've already heard about planets and planet mapping. So what I like to talk, call this talk, at least part of what I'm going to talk about today, is listen to your plant, which is the plant mapping, but count your bugs. Uh, one of the things, I, the, the theme today is integration. So you've heard about how the plant integrates for, for the water, for the growth, for the fruit production, for the nitrogen. Um, it also integrates for our, uh, for our lagus management. So one of the things that's already happened is we're at a situation where uh, I don't know, I've heard different stories around here. You've had some high counts, but it's been more moderate. Uh, some places I know down at, uh, um, outside of Fresno in a certain location, um, at um, certainly down in the Button Willow area, and then down some fields I've looked at at 198 near the aqueduct uh, outside of Huron. We're seeing extreme numbers. So we're seeing numbers that are 40 times greater than the threshold at the time. Uh, we're seeing things that a 40 count you take out uh, and it comes back two weeks later, 10 days later at a 30 count. Take it down again, it comes back at 15 count. It was just 30 counts just this week. This is with five applications of very, very broad spectrum as well as selected materials. It's just there's a, in that particular field, that particular area, there is a stored up demand of ligus that just keeps coming out, coming out, coming out. Products are working, but it's not, uh, it's just being overwhelmed. One of the things I do want to mention, because we have Judy Rayleigh here from uh, Cotton Growers Association, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about our efforts to get um, a Section 18 emergency crisis exemption for Transform, a Dow product, uh, so Floxifor. Uh, that We want to talk about that. I want to talk to one of y'all just talk about, it's not just Ligus we're fighting, it's aphid. It's not just aphid we're fighting, we're looking at what's going to happen in the next month or so with whitefly now that a lot of fields have absolutely decimated, not even decimated, because decimated means you only killed one in ten. We've killed them all in terms of our beneficial insects, which is one of the reasons why we want another selective product there in the next six weeks to try and bring back some of those. We're looking at fields that are really far behind now because they've lost their bottom crop. And so I'm just going to talk just for a second about that. Why is that? But why is that uh, important? This is such a great thing to bring up. I'm going to tear it short. Um, we're looking at the number of fruiting branches. We talked about the first position. We're talking about the retention on the first and the number of lights. So this is the sweep counts we're talking about. But our thresholds aren't static. When I started, it was 10 ligas per 50 sweeps. Or the one light is per 100 squares when I started in the 70s. Now it's very, very flexible because it doesn't matter what took that fruit. If it was lightest, okay. If it was cultivated blight, okay. It doesn't matter. What we want to know is what kind of a fruit set do you have? So here's just an example. If you had 70% retention on the bottom, this is what your expectation on the top should be. So if you're at 14th fruiting branch and only 30% retention on the top, that's okay because you've got the set on the bottom. But, look the next one, there is a chart that you just were handed that covers all this in excruciating detail is if you have only 30% retention on top, look what happens to what your expectations are. Everything gets shifted over because you're dependent upon that fruit to get into the basket. So what if it was, we're talking about 2 to 5 early out, 5 to 10 about now, and greater than 50 later on in, in terms of, of lightest numbers. But these could be adjusted depending upon where you're sitting here. If you've got to protect these things because you don't have a bottom set, and I've seen stuff. Dan, do you remember what that was on the bottom? of that one field stand here it is. Remember we looked at out there with Chris, Kristen? Was it? Uh, oh, we had, we had some pretty low retention. Yeah, there. very low retention. We're probably 30% if we're lucky. Yeah, 40, yeah 30 yeah. to 50 was pretty common. Yeah, so yeah. they've been hammered and hammered. I've talked to folks who have been Those the are some of the plants plant. we're looking at also. Yeah, really. yeah right there, that, that, that yeah. complete lap. So so this thing is, 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 is really dependent upon how many squares you, what your bottom set looks like, how your crop is really developing. And then you adjust your top, that is to say, the pressure you have dependent upon that. 
So we're now looking at anything from five to 10 lagas per sweep during this particular period. Uh, assuming, of course, that you've got some set on the bottom. And, and that's, the, that's the kicker there, is what your PCA, what your experience in that field has been. Um, I think that's what so just, just to try and, try and draw this in from what you've heard about plant mapping, plant development, et cetera. So what happens if you don't have that bottom crop? You heard that it could go vegetative. I'm hearing people saying, well, I'm going to look at irrigation, nitrogen, and picks to try and manage some of that. Um, you're talking about setting. If it has to compensate, then you're talking about time. If you're talking about time, you're talking about a later harvest. Later harvest means if you're one of the last fields in the area, you're the, you're the white fly magnet. Um, you're talking about uh, uh, you're talking about possibly some difficulty in defoliation and, and preparation for harvest. So it's it's that's exactly my ring, which is why I keep looking at my phone. Um, the Pavlov reaction. Um, so it's 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 really really important that the, you know this is all that integration we're talking about, which you as a farmer have always done uh, in this thing, trying to trying to manage all these sorts of things. So okay, so we've got a problem. Now what do we do about it with our toolbox? One of the things that I handed out too is this particular one. This is our decision tool. I printed it this morning. You're welcome to go and go to the, go to the website that you find here. You can find that website that I printed this out. And you can put, uh, put aphid and whitefly and lycus in there together and look at what your, what your options are in management. But I did it for lycus here because it kind of shows us what our toolbox is. And certainly we want to conserve natural enemies. We, if we can develop a regional pest management plan, and in this area north, you see a lot of people leaving those strips of alfalfa out there to try and manage ligus. This is a really exemplary area for people who have, have gotten in the habit of leaving strips of alfalfa when they go to harvest. I think that's, that's great. You can be managing neighboring crops. But chemical control is where you're at right now, because you know, the beneficial insects, if you're getting this overwhelming number, are not going to keep up with the ligus, particularly the ligus adults. So we go down to our toolbox, which is our, our insecticide. Now I did a little, a little summary of that, and there are five AI active ingredients listed. This isn't the complete list, but it's what you see, and this is only for lichens that we're talking about right now. Fifty percent of those on the list are pyrethroids. We have one, or we have two organophosphates. We list one carbamate, and we have two neonicotinoids. And those. One of those neonicotinoids is leverage, which is both a pyrethroid and a neonic. So basically, we have an awful lot of pyrethroids, single, single action. The carbamate vitae is not available due to, in the commercial chain due to uh, some disruptions in the commercial chain. So that one's out. Um, I know people down south that have put on pyrethroid organophosphates uh, mainly dimethylate. There's people using orthene as well uh, and, and have had very good luck with not blowing up mites. That's been one of the problems with it. But it's been a pretty good product to do that where you have these large infestations. We've requested Section 18, actually you did, the cotton industry has, and Bob and I have supported that, that request for a, for a product uh, transform. It's a Dow product, and Nick is here if you had direct questions about it. As emergency exemption, mo all the other cotton states have this Section 18. We never even got this fully registered in California. It was, it was DPR was taking a look at it, and then there was a lawsuit. The product was then removed from the market. It's now back, in, in, you know, they're building it back into various crops. Cotton wasn't one of them, but they've gotten to Section 18 in all the other states. Our primary problem is the toolbox we have works okay under light to moderate populations. These overwhelming populations are just something where we just can't keep up with it. And we really, not that transform is going to be the solution to it, but it gives us now a mid-season combined with carbine or flunicamid, some selectivity to manage ligus, adults and nymphs, while not putting too much pressure on the beneficial insects that can kind of be coming back in. We've used a lot of pyrethroids in some areas, which is bringing on aphid. We saw this back in the mid-90s. I don't know how many of you remember those years where, again, not to pick on a product, but it happened to be bifenthrin at the time, that went out everywhere because it was such a great ligus material. One application, three weeks protection. 
almost every acre got it, and that's when we found out that that actual product created more reproductive potential in aphids. And it took us a couple of years to get it back into shape. It not only killed the beneficials, but directly affects the aphid, not only by phenthrin, but many by erythroids. Affects the actual reproductive nature of that aphid. You couple that with the cooler temperatures we had early out, to the cooler periods we had, I should say. Um, and you start now to get those dark forms of, of the cotton aphid we've seen, which tend to be even more, if we, in the biological parlance, fecund or more reproductive. So I think there's, I don't, there might be a little bit of these, but I haven't seen aphid in, in cotton fields really that bad for a number of years. I think it's the fact that we disrupted the system because we had to. If you got a 40 count, you got to knock it down. So you're going to impact uh, the relationships to the other pests. So while we're doing this, we may be also releasing potentially some of our early white fly. I don't know. Arizona certainly says that. They say, you know, they're, they're the general predators out there are their major source of keeping that white fly population down early out. So I'm going to say that we're probably impacting that as well, just with the general predators we have. Potentially. So we want to be watching for that in the next two to three weeks as we start to see some white fly normally want to start watching in July and really be careful in August. But again, we're pushing our season back slightly for a couple of reasons. One, the compensation of the crop we have to do. Two, a little bit more water this year. So we can take it a little further. People may feel a little bit more comfortable and say, well, I can, you know, I can, I can push that back a little bit more. But the argument we made for that section, section 18, is that we really, um, we're having continued lightest pressure. The pressure should be declining as everything else is pretty much emptying out. Tomatoes are beginning to come in. You're going to get a little bit of impact from the tomatoes, perhaps. But if we have a pro an additional product to carbine that we can now rebuild our system, hopefully, to take care of some of the aphid, that would be great. I'm just going to mention aphid real quick before Jody comes up and tells us what the status of that Section 18 is. Is that um, uh, I had some questions about imidacloprid through the drift system, and it seems to be working or not working. Uh, Admire versus some of the other products. You know, I just haven't looked at it because we've never had a situation uh, quite like this. Uh, it's a very interesting question. My question is: Is why isn't platinum another another uh, uh, neonicotinoid? Why isn't that registered for drip in, in cotton? I don't know. It's registered as another uh, foliar product in cotton. It's never been registered as a. That's another one that could even come in later after that to uh, to see if that wouldn't help on on uh, on aphid. Very very you know. The last time we went through this, we didn't have this many drip irrigated acres. I mean, it's amazing to me the number of irrigated acres we have now under drip. It's it's really you know it's really a primary. Uh, it could be a uh, you know a primary source of uh, delivering our insecticides where we have. Them. Um, I was reminded that with clopyrifos, cotton is exempt during this high ozone period uh, for the high VOC. So it's basically, um, you know, the, the, the high fuming uh, 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 products such as Lohr's band um, can be used with for cotton aphid, but only for cotton aphid. Uh, if you have a problem that you needed it for white fly and only white fly, then you've got to go to, to the to the other low VOCs. So just an FYI, you may look at it in some of the other crops like like um, navel orange worm control and almonds and go, oh, I can't use the high one because we're in this zone. Cotton is exempt in this time. The cotton, California Cotton Growers Association made the case we need that high VOC for getting into the canopy and controlling our sticky cotton issues. Um, Pretty much all the information on how to evaluate is there. I handed out. Really, it's now a matter of management, and um, um, our toolbox is pretty slim. And again, I think it's the toolbox is okay in moderate to light issues, or a problem. Even if you have a high count and you spray it once with a pyrethroid, take care of the problem. Your 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 infestation finished, but it isn't. It's going on week after week after week. I will say one other thing. Um, while I was putting the, my part of the Section 18 together, I was rapidly going through Dr., the late Dr. Larry Godfrey's reports. 
he's the one that's been doing all this efficacy work for decades. And one of the things he's been doing is he's been looking at ligus over the last at least eight to ten years and doing bioassays to see where the resistance tolerance is to ligus on all these different groups of chemicals. And it varied from year to year, but uh, and, and, and the data is being collected with being, you know, it really doesn't show anything on a, on a year to year basis. Uh, most of the reports he put in, he had to put it in before the data was fully analyzed, so there's not a whole lot of summarization analysis done. But in a couple of reports, he does note that pyrethroids seem to work well once, but expose them twice or three times, and you see that amount of tolerance go up. And we've seen that, I remember this back with the spider mite, when we had Kelthane and Omite, and that was about <laughs> it. That it was a recessive, genetic recessive uh, response, so that that it resets itself over the dormant period. It, they breed and then it, you know, the recessive goes back away, now they're susceptible, until you hit it once. Then you've got a lot more tolerance there. That seems to, in my mind, seems to be a little bit with the pyrethroids. And I've talked to folks who've said, yeah, we kind of get one shot at it, and so where they're really trying to knock that stuff down twice, that was one of our other arguments, why we need an additional AI out here, active ingredients. So, if you're ready, Jody, maybe you can update us on, on what the what's your uh, what the industry's doing to try and get this section 18. Yeah, sure. of course. Um, so, as Pete mentioned, we went ahead and got a section 18 um, submitted, and it was surprisingly a pretty quick turnaround uh, from when we were alerted to the issue um, with the assistance from Pete and Bob. We were able to get a complete application together within about less than a week and a half, and. These applications usually take quite a bit of time, more than that, um, to get them submitted to DPR. Um, one of the really encouraging things once we uh, got the Section 18 kind of um, rolling and started working on it was DPR was surprisingly very um, proactive to communicate with us some of the conditions that um, we can glean off of the Arizona application to help speed the, the process up with the California application. So the initial communication that we received from DPR was encouraging. Um, it showed uh, their um, intensity to try and help us along and get this application going as fast as possible. And we're even the ones suggesting that um, we go ahead and proceed with it being a crisis exemption. Um, since then, we've maintained um, a lot of communication with the department um, moving forward with this application. Um, most recent communication was actually this past Friday. Um, in reviewing the application, they just had a couple of questions, needed a little bit more additional information, um, and we were happy to provide that and got it to them within 24 hours of them asking those questions. Um, from right now, um, it's going to be going through the stations at DPR, um, each of the uh, stations within the department. They're going to make some notes or have some questions, considerations, and again, we'll turn right around and get them that information that they need. Um, I just want to take a really a uh, quick moment to thank Pete and Bob for the amount of effort that they're putting into it. Um, they've been able to answer every single one of my questions, emails, phone calls, and um, have taken a lot of time out of this really critical part of the season um, to help us out get this application. So um, a big thanks to them in helping us get that along. Uh, we're gonna keep you up to date um, with any information that we have regarding the application. <coughs> I actually have a copy of it here, so if anybody has any more detailed questions, I'd be happy to go over them with you. And um, if you would like the latest information, you can go to our website and subscribe to our latest news um, notifications, and we send those um, kind of pertinent industry information out in that channel. So um, I have some business cards, too, if you guys would like any further information or would like me to um, send over anything over to you. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Keith. Well, thanks. And just a quick question, and Nick, if you don't want to answer this, that's okay, but if the Section 18 was to come through, you guys are ready to be able to provide material, et cetera? <laughs> You'd be happy to do it? <laughs> I'm just, you know, because we can't go forward with this. We don't even start this unless the, uh, unless the, the registrant says, yes, we support this, and B, we can, we can have it. So yeah. Nick I is very confident that... <laughs> 
I would note too, Dow has been an extremely useful tool for us to get this through. Um, to and they've indicated their support and have been helping us with that communication with DCR to get over um, information from previous Section 18. So big thank you to Dow as well. Okay, um, we're over time. Oh no, we well no, we had till 12:30. Yeah. Shoot. I had plans. <laughs> so let's, let's go ahead and do a.